Thank you, Maurice. I appreciate that introduction, and <clears throat> I have stories I could tell, but I won't. You know, in the U.S., we've uh, been worried about it every uh, so many years, uh, any number of things, and uh, we, we have just been in the process of trying to conclude our own, what we uh, refer to as a farm bill, um, agricultural policy. Um, we have nearly concluded that, and uh, after about three long years of struggle, <clears throat> and I'll be happy to tell you uh, what I do know about the uh, position that we're in there now. We also, of course, worry about such things as immigration and the porosity of our borders. And uh, a number of years ago, it was our southern border that we were most worried about, and we've been building big fences and things like that along many other stretches. But this year, I'm going to start lobbying for the border to our north because we have had an incredible amount of what I understand to be Canadian cold air down in our part of the country, and it's been very cold. So um, not all of us have been uh, experiencing this warmth. So I wanted to talk a little bit today about <coughs> dairy policy uh, in a world that's beginning to get to be small. And it's certainly been true for the United States as we've struggled with thinking about what do our farmers actually need in the way of policy and what do they have in the way of opportunities um, uh, in, in the world. And our world has changed quite a bit. Most of our agricultural policy is really passed periodically as what we do call this thing a farm bill. And it's supposed to be a five-year duration. This is policy that typically sunsets at the end of a bill period of time. But it often takes us more than uh, the year that it sunsets to get the next stretch of five-year policy up and going. That certainly has been true this time as well. We are currently without a farm bill. It's not a big deal for a period of time, but if we are without a farm bill, then we usually would have an extension to carry the old policies forward until the new one is implemented. We are at a period of time right now when our House has passed a version of the farm bill, and our Senate will soon begin to think about that as well. The policies that are under a farm bill actually do sunset at the end of that time period unless they are renewed. And what I would also tell you is that our farm bill contains a lot of legislation. It's an omnibus bud or bill, um, a lot of stuff wrapped into a single vote. The agricultural portion of it does not really constitute the majority of the projected expenses to uh, the taxpayers for the bill. The agricultural portion of our farm bill is only about 20 percent of the total expenditures. The other 80 percent um, is largely dealing with food and nutrition programs across the country, some of it with forestry and other programs like that. But agriculture constitutes about 20 percent of this very large bill. I put a graph in there that's going to be too um, small for you to actually read, I guess, uh, at this kind of distance, but there is a very small segment within agriculture. This is all about the pieces of agriculture, such as crop insurance, and um, other major items. Crop insurance is the large yellow wedge in there. I put this up because dairy is shown in there as being zero percent. It's not actually zero. We spend real dollars on dairy, but it's so small that it's lost in the decimal points of the spending on our agricultural portion of the farm bill. So it's, it's almost insignificant. We also do have a few pieces of legislation <clears throat> that are considered to be permanent law. It's not the same as the farm bill. And permanent law would include such things as our federal milk marketing orders. <clears throat> and we've also had, um, as part of permanent legislation, a dairy price support program. That price support program has been overridden by the farm bills for very many years. It has been completely inactive. And it is something that could be invoked again if we didn't pass a farm bill. Um, but since we are passing it, it's going to also go into sleep mode and not be invoked. So there is some permanent legislation that addresses dairy. When you think about what has been the biggest risk that dairy producers are facing, the thing in which they would say, we need help with, um, it's difficult for us to solve this problem on our own, I think they would tell you, price volatility. This is a graph that goes back to about 1990s or uh, late part of the 80s here 
and shows you the increasing milk price volatility that we've been experiencing um, in the United States. This volatility has gone from some of the peaks um, uh, to troughs within a few months period of time that have been essentially a halving or a doubling of milk prices. So um, this kind of volatility has caused some real problems with concerns. Most notably, in 2009, we had a tremendous drop in milk prices that took us down to a level that was um, very difficult for dairy farmers to deal with. There were very few farms that were cash flowing during this period of time, and an awful lot of equity was chewed up as farms drew on their credit reserves. We've also had, more recently, um, volatility in feed costs, feed prices, the major inputs to producing milk. And you'll notice on a graph like this, this is a buildup of um, what the National Ag Statistics Service would call the value of the dairy ration. It's for 100 pounds of ration equivalent. It's made up of a certain amount of corn, a certain amount of soybean meal, a certain amount of alfalfa hay. And this calculated value of the ration um, had been at about $5 per 100 pounds of, of this ration for many, many years, some ups and downs. But when we hit 2008 with the oil crisis and um, our implementation of ethanol production, it had the impact on dairy producers of nearly doubling that ration value over a short period of time. It declined from that, but you'll also see that it rose again to peaks that were greater than they were before up to this $11, $12 range. More recently, and I've been just the last few months since our harvest season concluded, um, we've had uh, a drop in this value of the ration. So for dairy producers, it's volatility both on the uh, price side of the product they're selling and on the major cost of producing that product. This is a margin graph, a milk minus feed cost margin. And you'll notice that there's a great deal of volatility in this graph period. You'll see in 2009, which is the first major trough that we had um, there, where prices fell below a $4 margin for a number of months. This was when those milk prices declined rather dramatically. In 2012, we didn't have so much of a milk price decline, but this was when feed costs increased rather dramatically, and again, we dropped below this $4 margin. So dairy producers have been trying to focus on policy that would give them an insurance product to insure against this milk feed price margin. The calculation of this margin is something that we call the U.S. all milk price. It's not regionally differentiated. It's a national price, and so uh, it's the U.S. all milk price and it is a value of a dairy ration. Not quite the one that I showed you, but one that parallels that fairly closely. Dairy producers would be able to purchase um, a uh, margin insurance to protect margins somewhere between $4 and $8 per 100 pounds of milk, and they would be able to do that in 50 cent increments. The premium structure for dairy producers would of course be graduated as you're moving up to higher levels of margin coverage. It becomes increasingly expensive and in fact this is nothing linear at all. It, it becomes um, kind of a sweet spot for dairy producers at a margin that's somewhere near a long-term average of about six dollars and fifty cents per hundred pounds of milk. Um, <clears throat> After that level of $6.50, those margin premiums begin to be very large indeed, uh, up to the $8 margin. There's also a social aspect that's been built into what's been proposed. We have, um, and I'm, I will talk in terms of uh, production in pounds or uh, of milk because that's the way we denominate it in our country. Um, but the uh, social aspect would favor dairy farm herds that are about 180 cows or so. The premiums for the first 4 million pounds of milk, which is about 180 cows, would be much lower premium rate than the premiums paid to cover milk production above 4 million pounds sold annually. So again, there is a social aspect to it where we would like to provide some benefit to the smaller farms that may in fact have a higher cost structure than larger farms do. 
The early proposals that were being thrown around and entertained and in fact um, strongly promoted by a number of dairy organizations representing uh, dairy farmers um, had included a soft quota uh, or, or supply management on here on milk productions. So when we got into periods of time that were a low margin situation, um, that would be anything under that $6 level, uh, there would be some impact not only to pay for the insurance that you may have bought um, on your milk supply, but if you were participating in that margin insurance program, you would also be obligated um, to correct uh, the market price by being strongly encouraged to contract your milk production. Um, you would not be paid for any milk production over a historic base that you would have during the time periods when these margins would be low. And those soft quotas, if you will, um, would get stronger as we got to lower levels of margin until uh, milk producers would not have been paid for up to 4% of their milk production during time periods when we had a $4 margin. So this was referred to as a market stabilization program or DMSP, Dairy Market Stabilization Program. Um, this turned out to be the very controversial part of the bill. What's been happening? Well, uh, initially the Senate passed their version of a farm bill. We, we, we have uh, legislation that would require each of our houses or chambers to um, pass a bill and if there are differences between the bills in the two chambers then they have to reconcile those differences. The Senate was the first one to pass their version of a farm bill and it included uh, in dairy policies this market stabilization or the quota program. That drew some strong political battle lines in the United States. Dairy processors were almost uniformly opposed uh, to any form of supply management. And there were a number of vocal dairy producers themselves who were also opposed to any form of supply management. But the majority of dairy producers felt like, yeah, this is an acceptable trade-off for us to have more stable milk prices. But in our um, House version of the bill that was passed, this price stabilization part of it was stripped out of the bill and they were left with a margin insurance only. It turns out that the Speaker of the House, um, a uh, Congressman Boehner, referred to this as being Soviet-style farm policy. Strong words indeed, but it indicated, I think, the strength of his emotions uh, when looking at this. Uh, there are many farm policies that he's not a big fan of, but he is most assuredly in a position to make sure that something like this doesn't happen. So it was stripped out of the House version of the bill. It made it back in in conference, though, between the House and the Senate um, to uh, include this, and Speaker Boehner essentially told the House that I will not bring this up to the floor even for a vote if that's included. Apparently, he cared a lot about that. So because of this very strong and immovable stance, the conference committee decided to work out the differences between these two bills, and it didn't include anything in the way of supply management for dairy. What did it include? Well, when he refused to bring that to the floor, the compromise that came out of here actually looked just like margin insurance with no penalty to dairy producers for low margin episode periods of time. Here's what we get. Dairy producers will have an opportunity annually to think about the coverage level that they want to have for the milk production in the year ahead. And the choice that they can make is that they will have a basic production history and that production history will be the highest milk production that that farm actually achieved in either 2011, 2012, or 2013. So that milk production is already in the books. It's not something that dairy farmers can do anything about. But based on that milk production, uh, they will be able to cover 25 to 90% of their production history. And they can choose each year how much or what level of production uh, history coverage they want to have between a four and an eight dollar margin in 50 cent increments. As I mentioned before, uh, we did have the survival of the four million pounds uh, which will have much lower premiums uh, for that level of milk production. And we will have 
a discount on those premiums even for those producers in the first two years that the farm bill's there. The idea is to begin to encourage dairy producers to think about uh, purchasing this insurance, the supplemental insurance. The other thing that is an aspect of this program that um, nobody saw coming until the last minute, I guess, or the last week or so that they were in discussion, and that is rather than having supply management, I would say that we've got a program now that's going to focus a little bit on demand management. And by demand management, I mean that if we get into that $4 margin situation, which is pretty extreme, we've seen that in a couple of time periods, but it's pretty extreme, um, the government will be authorized to purchase dairy products off of the marketplace for distribution through non-commercial channels. So food, school food programs, for example, or food pantries might receive um, dairy products under this in an effort to try and shore up milk prices. So um, I'm going to offer an opinion. An opinion is that policy, dairy policy in particular that I'm talking about here, can only do so much to actually moderate some really large and sweeping trends that we have in our dairy industry. For example, we've had a continuous trend toward much larger and many fewer dairy farms. Um, today in the United States we have only about um, 48,000 dairy farms in the country. Um, when I first started being aware of dairy, I guess we had more than 3 million dairy farms in the country. So we've had a real contraction um, of dairy farms. And at the peak, which was back in the uh, 1930s, we had something like 6 million dairy farms. So a lot of contraction has taken place. And of course, we're producing much more milk than we ever have. We also have a lot of technology adoption that's pushing us toward those larger farms. Um, and of course, even this price volatility is something that's new for us, but I think it's kind of fundamental to the market situation in which we find ourselves. Policy can only do so much to address those things. And generally speaking, policy can either retard or slow down a trend a little bit, it's not gonna take it away completely, or it can enhance a trend a little bit if you want to. So at the edges, it can moderate these things, but it can't really change them in the long term. If you have agronomic resources that are superior, when market prices prevail that are good, the comparative advantage will be to produce this product at this point in time and in this location. And in the United States, we've been having quite a shift, actually, in uh, where milk is being produced and under what circumstances. But we've also had some policy changes that impact us you know, from around the world. And what's happening elsewhere is impacting what's happening in the United States. Uh, I'm not going to tromp on James's uh, talk any, I hope, but the European Union had kept their dom domestic prices high with export subsidies um, to move product, as much product out of the EU as they needed to for a long period of time and with production quotas in different countries. They did this to keep their farm prices high and a vital agricultural industry. Many emerging countries have had a greater demand for dairy products as they wanted to improve the quality of their diet. And we find that the common agricultural policy reforms in the European Union um, as they're being implemented and with that new demand, world traders have kind of changed positions or shifting positions. The U.S. is now a significant world exporter, whereas um, four or five years ago, we were insignificant. We didn't think about the U.S. as being a major world exporter. This graph that I'm showing you is showing you farm gate prices in a variety of countries of the world. The dashed blue line on the bottom left that you'll see um, is Australia. The solid blue, lighter blue line down there is New Zealand. U.S. is the red line. The dark blue line starting toward the top on the left is the European Union and the dashed brown line is Canada. So we have countries doing some very different things. As the EU has been eroding their support for exporting dairy, uh, taxpayer dollars exporting dairy products, you'll notice that relative to the other major exporting countries, um, farm gate prices have been declining or collapsing. Now, during the first major portion of this time period, two-thirds of this graph on the left, uh, 
Um, the U.S. was not a world exporter. We were just hum bumbling along in our own way, producing as much as our domestic economy wanted and needed. Canada, of course, was doing its own thing during this time. Now, if you look at this graph, I think you can see that the producers who were most significantly disrupted and angry about changing policies were European Union dairy farmers as their purchasing power eroded over this time period. The farmers who were unequivocally better off were Australia and New Zealand. These were people who saw world prices beginning to rise and pulling theirs, lifting their product prices up. And it wasn't until about 2007 when these four countries or major regions of the world, the European Union, US, New Zealand, and Australia, um, had prices converge at the farm level uh, that all of us were competing for those marketplaces then. And of course, Canada is doing their own thing. Now, one thing that I've learned, I think, about dairy producers is that they seem to hate profits. They don't like them. If you look at New Zealand and Australian dairy producers who were the beneficiaries of the European Union's evolving policy out there, their prices came up. And what happened is that they began to capitalize those profits into their most constrained resource. In countries like New Zealand, land is the most binding constraint. And if you look at a 20-year time period in New Zealand, they've had a seven-fold increase in land prices, moving from about $5,000 a hectare to up around $35,000 a hectare. So land's a binding constraint for New Zealand dairy production. If you look at Canada, I would argue that quotas, the most binding constraint that Canadian dairy producers face. And I think that these are accurate. Um, depending on the province you're looking at, you have quota values around $25,000 to $42,000 per kilogram of butter fat. Um, fairly significant um, market value for that binding constraint. If you look like at the United States, we've had some market-driven constraints from time to time. In 2007-8, when milk prices were very high uh, in comparison to uh, what we had seen, we couldn't find cows fast enough. And during that short period of time, we almost doubled the value, market value of a cow um, as we were bidding up the value of the animals that had been our most binding constraint during that time period. So an observation, <clears throat> since the world dairy traders out there are receiving about the same farm gate milk price, they all face a very similar total cost of production. Some of these costs that we're bidding into the constrained um, or the, the binding constraints out there become fixed costs for us. But those cost structures are rather different. The fixed costs are the costs that you're committed to uh, in the short run. The variable costs are costs that you can, or expenses that you can change quite quickly. Uh, we aren't necessarily committed to those. If you take a look at what economics would say, um, is that you shouldn't produce if milk price or price of any good falls below your variable costs of production. You'll lose less money by not producing. It's not easy to do with a dairy farm. But in relative terms, I'm showing on the left-hand side of that graph um, the difference between fixed costs in red and variable costs in blue for the United States and fixed cost and variable cost for New Zealand. Quite different. If the milk price falls to, say, 30 dollars per kilogram or per hundred kilograms or less, then the United States would find that we lose less money by um, not milking cows, uh, turn the tap off. Uh, on the other hand, New Zealand would not find that they almost ever would have to even consider this. So I think that the U.S. faces price risk, um, whereas a country like New Zealand faces more production risk. Even within the U.S., our business models are different. We have regions of the country that have relatively higher variable costs and uh, regions of the country that have relatively lower variable costs. Um, that is true for the Northeast, for example, Northeastern Quadrant. And if you look at just this last 
three quarters of the year that we had um, data on for all of the states, 50 states, you'll notice that the states that are showing in green, these are states that have actually increased milk production over the time of the first three quarters of the year are what we might call our traditional dairy regions. These are regions of the country where we own a land base that's equivalent to producing at least our forage needs for the farms for the most part. The farms that are shown in red or pink are farms that have lost milk production during this first three quarters of the year and those are farms um, that are buying a much higher proportion of their feeds and able to cover less of that. So higher variable cost, lower fixed cost. They had to bow out when feed prices were high and strong. So an observation out there. Relative to world traders, the U.S. tends to be high variable cost production. It means that as these prices are volatile and moving around, we're the first ones that have to bow out. We're sprinters. I would say that there's nobody in the world that can produce milk as fast as we can or turn around and increase milk production as rapidly as we can. But, you know, like a sprinter, we, we can't be there for the long run. Um, we, we have to drop out um, when our milk prices fall uh, to relatively lower levels. And in particular, even within the U.S., it's the Western dairy producers that are balancing uh, milk supplies not only in the US but primarily for the world as well. So we didn't sign up for that but it turns out that we actually are balancing probably much of the world's needs um, for milk supply. Balancing is all kinds of fun on the upside. There's nothing like building barns, throwing on cows and going to it but it's no fun at all on the downside. In 2009 when we went through that um, serious milk price trough it was estimated that dairy farms in, the, in our country may have lost as much as 30% of their equity during that one year alone. And many of the farms that rely on um, high purchase uh, feed costs uh, may have lost even more during 2012. So what will our new dairy policy do out there? Basically, I would say there is no reason to not sign up for this. It is a voluntary program, but uh, there's no reason that you wouldn't sign up for it. There's no penalty. The only penalty is $100 a year that you pay in, in administration fees, um, which on a dairy farm is a big deal, um, no deal at all. But it's quite possible that we can have adverse selection. So for example, here near the beginning of this year, if we look at the year ahead, this chart is showing you a 50% um, forecast interval on this milk feed price margin and you'll notice that at no point in time does it even get down close to an eight dollar level uh, where the highest level of coverage would make an indemnity payment to dairy producers. So we're expecting a good year this year for our dairy producers. If I'm a dairy producer I would look at a year like this and say give me the free stuff. I don't want to pay anything in the way of premiums this year. Some years that's not going to be the case. We have the opportunity to change our production levels or our uh, coverage levels. It will reduce the risk of low income to dairy producers. There's no question about that. If you're involved in this and you've bought coverage, you will receive an indemnity payment during the years when you have low margins. But of course, this reduces risk to dairy farms and less risk, we think, means more milk production. More milk production would also imply a lower average milk price over the time period and thus the need for the program. <laughs> um, so there's likely to be um, some longer term problems, uh, but we don't know how big those might be as time goes forward. My estimation is that this is going to be an expensive program, but we've got five years to find out just how expensive it might be. So milk pricing in a global context some of our U.S. dairy farms are trying to think about changing their structure. They've recognized that the business model that we employ of being a high variable cost producer can be great, but it can also have serious downsides out there. And we have a number of dairy farms that are trying to procure more land to grow a higher proportion of their feed. Some of our farms, I think, will be better off if they're pre prepared to stop milk production in a down phase. 
I know personally of a few, but trust me, only of very few farms that anticipated that 2009 was going to be a bad year. They actually depopulated their milking herd. They took the cows out, sold them. They kept the young stock, and the next year, as those stock began to mature and move into a, a milking herd again, they were back up and going. So this was a strategy that in hindsight was really brilliant for those farms. And I suspect more farms are going to need to be prepared to do that. We also know that our risk management tools, and there are a suite of them that can be used, are effective. They work. Such things as using our futures markets for milk and dairy products um, uh, are an effective risk management strategy for dairy farms, but they require, again, some time and some homework on the part of farms. And honestly, um, feeding, milking, and taking care of a dairy herd has enough complexity for most dairy producers right now, so many of them are simply not involved in the more formal risk management tools that they could be. Longer term, I suspect that the U.S. dairy industry is going to have to imagine an industry that doesn't have policy or regulation. And I say that because we're struggling with regulation, such as our federal milk marketing orders, and policy, such as this insurance product that we're looking at that's heavily subsidized, because A, policy is expensive, and B, regulation gets to be very difficult in an increasingly complex dairy world. So we need to think about what does the world look like when we no longer have this. We have some examples of other countries around the world that have managed to make this transition, but it's not always seamless. I think that if we're going to make a transition, we don't want to do it abruptly, but rather provide ourselves with a known endpoint and a glide path um, toward that. So with that, Maurice, I'm done with my comments, and uh, we'll take questions, I suspect, later. Yes. Thank you.